Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 112 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. And today, we're going to pray. Lord, give us our daily bread. Help us to understand that you are our daily bread, that we ought to seek you daily to be led by you. But also, Lord, help us to withstand the trials and the tribulations and the crushings and the breakings that will make us into bread, that others might be fed and edified as we become the body of Christ. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 26, Jesus has an exchange of words with a multitude. They come to him and they're asking him to feed them more bread because that recently, possibly even the day before, he had fed the multitudes with the loaves and fishes. And so it says that Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because you saw the miracle, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. See, Jesus was pointing out to them that he knew the intents of their heart. They weren't searching him out because they wanted him or believed him or even for the very miracle's sake, but that they just wanted a handout. They filled their bellies with the loaves and fishes and they were coming back because they wanted something else from him. They weren't seeking his face, his presence, his teaching, his words, but rather they were seeking gifts from him that they might consume it upon their own lust. They just wanted more food. So to this, I tell you that bait ministry does not work. You can't feed people to get them into church unless it's a genuine need, like feeding the poor or the homeless or the orphan or the widow. But when we do things to try to draw people in by appeasing or appealing to their flesh that they might consume these things upon their own lust, we're doing more damage than good because they're not coming for God. They're coming for us and what they can get from us. Jesus continues to point this out to them when he says, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do then that we might work the works of God? So now they see that he's not going to give them loaves and fishes for free. He's not going to feed them. He's not going to give them handouts. He's not going to give them gifts. And so then they ask him, well, how can we do these things that you did? How can we work these miracles? And they're not asking for selfless means that they might help others or that they might glorify God. They're asking a miss to consume it upon their own lust. They want it for their own gain, to fill their own belly. And in this we see why there are scriptures that say that the wicked, their God, is their own belly, what they can get for themselves to please themselves, to appease their own lusts and desires and perceived needs. So Jesus answers them and says, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who he hath sent. So they're asking Jesus, we want to do miracles. We want gifts. We want the power that we see manifested in you. And Jesus replies to them by saying, The work of God, what God wants of you, is that you believe in me whom he sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat from heaven. So we see they're trying to provoke him again to feed them. They're saying, okay, well, if God really wants us to believe in you, then show us a sign. Prove it again. Because remember Moses, he fed the people with manna from heaven in the wilderness. So we know that he's from God. So why don't you give us a handout again? And then maybe we'll honor you. Fulfill the lust of our flesh. And then maybe we'll believe you. So Jesus again replies to them and says unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you true bread from heaven. So we see now that Jesus is actually getting a little upset with them because that they're trying to say that they knew that Moses was of God because that Moses had the power to give them free stuff, to give them gifts, to bless them, to give them handouts, to provide this 
manna from heaven and Jesus is getting upset about it. And he's saying, no, he didn't. Moses didn't do any of it. Moses was just the messenger. It was God that provided the bread from heaven. Miracles don't come from a man. They wanted the ability to produce miracles so they could consume it upon their own lust. And when Jesus wouldn't tell them how, let me tell you something. There's no lesson, no teaching, no seminar that can teach you how to do miracles, how to bring forth healings, how to do any of the operations of the gifts of the spirit, because they are not given to man to fulfill the lust of the flesh. They are done by God himself. The operation of them are manifested from God only to validate a message from God. Which is exactly what Jesus told them. Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my father gave you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believed not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that to all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believe on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. You see, Jesus was delivering the message. They wanted to see the miracles. They wanted to consume the miracles. And then they wanted him to teach them how to do it, that they might get some glory for it or use it for their own selfish needs. This, And he said, no, Moses couldn't even do it in and of himself, but that God did it to prove the message that was coming forth, that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He is the manna from heaven. He is all that we need. He is what we should seek daily, our daily bread, that we should believe on him, that he is the son of the living God, that he was raised from the dead and that all who believe in his words and teachings and live by them will be raised again with him when he returns. In the end, believe on this and you'll do the will of the father. Believe on this and you'll do the works that he desires. And they murmured against Jesus in the very same manner that they murmured against the manna in the wilderness. Because the manna, the bread from heaven in the wilderness, it wasn't pleasant tasting. In fact, if you read the description, it pretty much tasted like raw oil. And so they didn't like the taste of it. It wasn't palatable. It wasn't pleasant. It was what they needed, but it's not what they wanted. And so they began to desire the foods of Egypt. They wanted the stuff that tasted good, that was sweet, that was pleasant, that was desirable. And so they cried out to God and said, we don't want this manna from heaven. We want the Pharaoh quails. We want the meat of Egypt. We want that thing that represents the enemy that you just freed us from because it's easier, because it's more pleasant, because it's more flattering, because it tastes better. And so just as they had turned their nose up at the gift of the manna from heaven in the wilderness, they turned their nose up at Jesus and walked away to the point to where Jesus turned to his disciples and said, are you going to leave me also? Because though he had the masses before, because he had done miracles, he had given a good presentation, he had delivered the word, they loved it, the people thought he was amazing for it, they even got free food and free meals, and oh, what a massive crowd that it drew in, but the very next day, they all left again, and he was down to just his core group, just a few, the ones who truly believed him. Oh, preacher, don't be discouraged when the calling comes, because it always does. Because there are those who come into the church and to Christ for selfish means. They bend the knee, but not out of humility, out of a give me spirit. And they will not stick it out, because when the truth of the gospel begins to play out, that it's about a crushing, that it's about a crucifixion, that it's about a sacrificed life and not about what he can give me. 
at least not here in the physical. Then they'll turn and walk away. It's a sifting. It's always been this way. Because God's trying to find the pure. And we're going to talk about that today. So in this passage, we see that Jesus said that he was the manna. He was the bread of life. And then we see in the story of the Last Supper, how they all came together. And then Jesus broke the bread and he, he said, this bread is my body that is broken for you. Again, we see that archetype of the bread representing the body of Christ, the physical body of Christ, that physical embodiment that affects the physical world around us. And so we see that in the parallel of communion also, that at the time it was a representation of an engagement, of a betrothal. So when the groom and the bride drank from the same cup, it was a covenant, it was an agreement that they were committed to be faithful to each other. And what does the Bible say about those who are married? They become one, one flesh, one body. So therefore, when we take communion, we are making a commitment to be faithful to Christ, to become his bride, to become one with him. And when we become one with him, then we become part of his body also. And therefore, we take on the role that he was fulfilling when he was physically here. We become the physical body that God's spirit uses to affect the physical world around us by its leading. You see, it's a divine exchange. At the Last Supper, the church became engaged to Christ. And then he wrote us a new will and testament in which he left everything, all of his power, authority, dominion, and might to his bride. And then he died so that the will could be enacted and the power could be passed to us. And so as his physical body left, he left us, the bride, because we are one body, one flesh, because of the agreement, the covenant, the marriage covenant, that we would be the body. He would be the head. His spirit would lead us, teach us, direct us, and then we would enact his will upon the earth. Now, in understanding that, we say that Christ was manna from heaven, right? He was not made. He just was. But we, however, we are wheat. Throughout scripture, the wheat always represented God's people, his church. And so the wheat in and of itself isn't automatically bread. It has to be made into bread. So today we need to look at the process by which wheat becomes bread, by which a convert becomes the body of Christ, how it is sanctified. And so to that, I ask you, what exactly is the job of the Holy Spirit? Because many seem to have the same mindset that that multitude did, that it's to please them, to feed them, to bless them, to give them gifts, or to make them popular or famous, when that is not his purpose at all. His purpose is to purify the wheat. In fact, the scripture says that God gave us his spirit to conform us into the image of Christ. In Matthew chapter 3 verse 10, it says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed, this is John the Baptist speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John the Baptist laid this out so clearly and perfectly in this passage. And I think that we rarely actually see what he is saying. He said that there is coming a day when the ax is going to be laid to the root and every man will be judged according to his fruit to see what spirit he was following. And all those which bear not the fruit of the Spirit will be cut down and cast into the fire. And then he starts talking about the Holy Spirit and its purpose. 
He said, I'm baptizing you with water unto repentance. This is the faith part. We've got to repent of our sins and faith that God's grace will be released to enable us to produce those good fruits and walk free in overcoming power and victory. He said, but there is one coming after me who's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he's got a winnowing fan in his hand and there's a wind blowing. But it's not what we think it is. It's not a wind that's bringing blessings and giftings only. It's a winnowing wind. We've got to get a hold of what this really is. Because the purpose of the winnowing wind, and we're going to talk more about this in a minute, but the winnowing wind is part of the process of turning wheat into bread. It's the purging. It's the purifying process. That gets all of the worthlessness out of the wheat so that it can be turned into something that is edifying. It says that the Holy Spirit's purpose is to thoroughly purge his floor. What floor? A threshing floor. The winnowing fan was to purge all of the chaff, the trash, the flesh out of the threshing floor and leave behind a pure wheat. And it says that this spirit, this wind, this fan in the hand of the man who will bring us this Holy Spirit will do a work to separate the chaff from the wheat and the chaff will be burned in fire. But the wheat is what he really desires. Because you see it is clarified even further in Titus chapter 2 verse 11 when it says for the grace of God that bringeth salvation it hath appeared unto all men and then it tells you its purpose. Now let me explain this. Grace is literally the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why it was the gift that was released after Christ's resurrection, just as the Holy Spirit was the gift that was released after the resurrection. See, John said, repent and make your crooked way straight and prepare ye the way of the Lord. First, repentance, that's the act of faith. Then the grace is released. It is the power, the infilling of his Holy Spirit, which equips us to walk free from sin. It is overcoming power. It is sonship. It is favor. It is his divine influence. It is the leading of his spirit. It is the equipping of the kingdom of God within us to manifest through us to prove the validity of the power of the atoning blood of Jesus. It says that grace was given for the purpose of bringing men to salvation and for it to teach us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things are what you need to speak, exhort, and even bring rebuke to cause people to understand with all authority and let no man despise you for it. The purpose of grace, which is the power of the Holy Spirit, is given to teach us to turn away from sin and cause us to walk in righteousness, to purify us, to make us a spotless bride, to turn the wheat into bread, the body of Christ, to conform us into his likeness. We understand that it says in the New Testament, that the Holy Spirit was given to make us a witness to all the earth. So I have to ask you, a witness of what? It's to make you a witness, a testimony, that the blood of Jesus overcame the enemy, that the blood cleanses and allows the Holy Spirit to indwell us, empowering us with the grace to overcome our witness, our testimony, is that we are changed, that we are born again of a new spirit that we've been made into something new that we've been conformed into his image that's why when Jesus talked about salvation he used terms that expressed a changing he said you must be born again you must be converted you must be made new so I'm here to help you understand today that the power and purpose of the Holy Spirit is to change you 
that your very life might be a witness that Jesus really is the risen Son of God, that others might believe on Him and be set free because it stirs the faith in them that they need to walk in the grace that God has provided to overcome the enemy. This is why the Bible says that we overcome him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, what Jesus did. And the word of our testimony, our life that proves there is a change, that we're no longer the same, that we've become the body of Christ, that we've been purified, purged by that winnowing fan, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8 verse 11 it says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors any more to the flesh. We do not have to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall surely die. But if we through the spirit do mortify or kill the the deeds of the body, we shall live eternally. For as many as are led by God's spirit, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have not received a spirit of bondage and weakness, but of power, of strength, and of a sound mind in the revelation and power of our God, knowing that we are sons and daughters of the Most High, and if we will be led of His Spirit, we will walk in the power of it. Not to achieve selfish needs, not for vain glory or blessing but for the saving of souls, deliverance, the edification of the greater body of Christ and the glory of our King. And above all, to let the world know that Jesus is Messiah and that he has made a way for all of us to be brought in to the family of God. It's all about reconciliation. The fact that we have been changed, that others can see a notable difference in our life, that the old person that we were no longer remains, is the witness, it's the testimony, it's the evidence, it's the fruit that the Spirit truly lives within us. So let's talk about the change. Let's talk about growing in grace. Let's talk about this sanctification process. Let's talk about how to turn wheat into bread. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being like this little seed. It's dried up. There's not much you can do with it. He says, but when you lay it in the ground and you cover it over it and you bury it, this is our crucifixion. This is where we lay down our life at the altar. This is where we are buried with Christ and it's got to die. And then when the rain comes... And God speaks life into it. The power of God's grace. There's not anything a man can do that can make that seed come to life. But to pray. But one day, all of a sudden, that thing springs into newness of life. And it's changed. It's completely changed. It's it's coming up. It's born again. It's different. And now it's something that can start to produce fruit. To feed others. There's so much that we can take from the entire life cycle. From the seed, to the wheat, to the bread. But it all starts here, when it's born again. But immediately when it's born again, it's, it's not fit to be turned into bread. It's not just like that manna from heaven. It's got to go through a process. There's some growing, there's some maturing. It's got to get to a point where it's starting to produce fruit. Because you see, Jesus gave us a parable about a master who planted a field of wheat. But the enemy, he came in and he sowed tares among it. And so the laborer came to him and he said, didn't you plant good seed? What is this? And he said, an enemy hath done this. He said, well, shall we pull up the weeds? He said, no, no, they've grown too close together. If you pull up the weeds, you'll uproot the wheat also. Let them grow together. And at the time of harvest, we'll separate the wheat from the tares. Well, let me explain something to you. The Lord had me to grow a wheat field and go through the entire process 
from seed to growing the wheat to threshing to winnowing to grinding to making it into bread. I, I went through all of it and there's quite a bit to be said about the revelation this process can truly bring to you about the word of God. Because the first thing you're going to realize is that when those tares grow up in the wheat in the beginning, they look exactly the same. It's hard to tell them apart. In the same manner that when the true Christian and the hypocrite come together in the church early on, it's really hard to tell them apart. There's not much you can really say about the one who's truly pure in heart and maybe just stumbling or not fully understanding. They're still growing in grace and the one who really has no intention of, of hearing what God has to say. But as they mature, as they grow, as time goes on, the difference becomes very evident. And this is how. As the wheat begins to put on its good fruit, its fruit is heavy and it bows down. It's humbled. It's bowed over. But the tares, the weeds, they stand proud. They do have a little bit of fruit on them, but the fruit is bad. It's not good for anything. In fact, in many cases, it's poisonous. So in this, we can see the true difference between the servant of the living God, the one who really has his spirit, and the one who has grown up among them, but not of the same spirit. The tares are proud. They do not bow down, and they produce bad fruit. Their fruit doesn't help anyone, and it surely will never be bread. So at the time of harvest, you go and you cut everything down and the tares you throw in the fire so that the seeds can be destroyed so that they don't continue to repopulate. And then you take the wheat and you've got to begin a process of separating the chaff from it. So what is chaff? When you harvest the wheat, for starters, the wheat is still attached to the stalk. You don't need the stalk. You don't need the leaves. You need just the wheat seed. And around the wheat seed, there is a paper hull. It looks just like the wheat, but it's useless. It has no nutritional value. It's basically like the flesh of the wheat, but it has to come off so that we can make it into bread. So the first place that this process begins is on the threshing floor. The threshing floor was a large, clear area, usually a solid floor that the wheat could be laid on and threshed, literally beaten until it came to a point where it broke loose from all of the chaff, the useless things that it was connected to. We see examples of this throughout scripture. A great one is in the Old Testament when King David began to count the congregation. God had not told him to count the congregation. It became a pride issue. Oh, let's see how many people I'm starting to gather in unto myself. Now they're starting to follow me. I'm getting a big following. Look how many people are coming in. It wasn't about him and it wasn't his doing. It was all by God's hand and he was not supposed to count them because we are supposed to be just as obedient to labor for one or two as we are for the multitudes. So God was greatly angered by this and he sent an angel of the Lord to enact wrath and poured out a plague on David and on the people. And where do you think that the angel stood as he began to beat the sin out of them? Literally on the threshing floor. And so David runs to him and repents. Of course, the threshing is always meant to bring us to repentance, to separate the sin from us. He repents and he says, no, no, lay not this sin upon the people, lay it upon me. I'm the one that's guilty of it. And so then David goes and he purchases this whole land where the angel stood and literally builds an altar of repentance on the threshing floor and then later a temple. But understand that we are the temple of the New Testament. So our altar of repentance is going to usually be found also in the place of threshing. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted? I will not give my glory unto another. Because he loves you, because he wants to use you, and because his name cannot be polluted with the flesh that is connected to you. He's got to take you through some stuff. He's got to take you through some trial and tribulation. He's got to take you through the furnace of affliction so he can separate you from the chaff that is rendering you useless to his service because he wants you to be part of him, his body, the bread. But he can't make bread out of wheat until first 
We've separated the chaff from it. To the church as a whole, tribulation is the threshing. He does not desire to do it, but when the church refuses to let go of the chaff that is making it useless and unable to become the bread, the body of Christ and rightly represent him in purity, that it might be presented to him a spotless bride, tribulation comes to purge it, to purify it, to thresh it. In fact, the very tool that was used to thresh the wheat was called a tribulon. It's where we get the modern word tribulation from. That's the purpose in it. So I don't know what kind of theology you've been taught, but I'm here to tell you today by scripture and the word of the Lord that if you have never been threshed, then you are not wheat. You are a tear. Because the tares are not threshed, they're just separated. The wheat, they are threshed to be made pure because there's a purpose for them. Paul said that if you have never been chastised by God, then it's because you and not his son. Because he is a good father and any good father will chastise their children to make them into good, productive members of society, of the family. And it's because he loves them that he teaches them, leads them, guides them, corrects them. And if you've never been corrected by him, it's because you're not in the family. Because he corrects his children. Not because he's mean, but because he loves them and he has a mighty purpose for them. The tribulant, as it beats the wheat, it literally rips that chaff, that flesh, off of it. A very powerful and true representation of it is the way the cat of nine tails literally ripped the flesh from Jesus. It's not a pleasant thing, but it's a necessary thing. Many times we go through trials as a family, as a group of friends, congregation, ministry teams. We go through these situations that seem so abrasive. And let me explain something. Whenever you go to thresh that wheat, you bundle it together into groups tightly because it's not always even so much the action of the tribulant hitting the wheat that is separating it. Sometimes it's the abrasiveness of the wheat coming against the other wheat that's actually doing most of the separating of the flesh from it. And in the same manner does the Bible say that iron sharpeneth iron, so does a friend sharpen the countenance of a friend. This is one of the main reasons for marriage. Because that the children of God would have been selfish, except that they have to live together with somebody else and submit one to another. And then God puts children in the mix so that they have to serve and tend to them. And it's all part of the process of breaking off pride and selfishness of getting the flesh off of us. And then he gives us friends that we've got to then learn how to deal with. And he gives us ministries and church families. And in all of these things and situations... As the hardship stirs up, more often than not, it's the way that we react off of each other that is going to break the flesh off of us more than the actual situation itself. But nevertheless, all of it works together to loosen the grip of the chaff on the wheat. So once that the threshing has done its work, then can come the winnowing wind. At this point, The wheat is gathered and all of the bits and pieces, they're all broken and mixed together. And they're brought out in front of a fan or a breeze or a wind. And they're tossed up in the air. And because the wheat is heavy and fruitful and the chaff is light and useless like paper, the wind blows it away and the wheat falls back down. And and so that it's a purifying process. It's purging out all of the uselessness. And this is exactly what John the Baptist said that the Holy Spirit is. It's a wind, but it's not just a gentle breeze meant to please you. It is literally the wind of the winnower's fan that is there to purge you, to purify you, to make that wheat usable to become the body of Christ that it might be edifying to feed others because it's never about us. It's always about the work of the kingdom. So first there is the threshing, and then there is the winnowing. 
The threshing is like the Passover season. That time when Jesus was threshed, I mentioned how the cat of nine tails was very much like a threshing tool, removing the flesh. He was whipped, he was beaten, he was battered, he was broken for our example because he had no sin, but he was the first representation of what we would be going through just like he did. Though his may be more intense, we still go through a type of it. So the Passover season was the threshing, the crucifixion, the Garden of Gethsemane, all of it. That broke the flesh before the winnowing process, the wind that blew on Pentecost. The Holy Spirit, the winnowing fan. Understand that when John the Baptist gave this word and said that this one was coming, who would then baptize with fire, who would have a winnowing fan in his hand that would purge his threshing floor. Immediately after he released this word, Jesus walked up to be baptized and the Holy Spirit came and rested upon him and stayed upon him. And immediately it says he was led of the Spirit into a wilderness to be tested there. And when he had endured the trial and temptation, it says he came out of that wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. And in this do we see another representation of this, the threshing before the winnowing, the wilderness before the promise, repentance before power, faith before grace, Passover before Pentecost. In fact, there is a scripture that says that we will receive the promise, but only after that we have done the will of God. There is a testing season. There is a threshing season that we must endure in faithfulness. And I know this is not a very pleasant message, but I need you to grab hold of this because I want to see the true body of Christ arise and not this mixture of chaff and weeds professing to be what it is not. We've got to understand the purpose in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is like a wind that is blowing through the trees and we don't know where it's come from or, or where it's going, but we can see the leaves moving so we know it's there. We see its effect on the physical world. The Holy Spirit is a wind. It's the wind from the winnowing fan in Jesus's hand and its purpose is to purge and purify the wheat. It is the Holy Spirit's job to make you holy. That's why it is the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the original text, it was actually called the spirit of holiness. And I actually like that more than the translation because we understand that when the Bible talks about a spirit of fear coming upon a person, it made them fearful or the spirit of jealousy came upon the man and he became jealous or the spirit of infirmity was on the woman. Therefore she became ill. So then we would have to understand likewise that when the spirit of holiness comes upon you, it is to make you holy. It's to influence you towards holiness, purity, sanctification, consecration, all of these words that we've taken out of our Christian vocabulary, much to the degradation of the body of Christ, that we barely have any bread left, but we sure have a lot of compromise. We sure have a lot of bless me messages that would have very much pleased that multitude that we talked about in the beginning. We got a lot of wheat that's being told that they can keep their chaff and God's all right with that. It's the Holy Spirit's job to make you holy. This is why Jesus said that only the fruits of righteousness or evidence of its presence. In the same manner that the wind blowing through the trees, though we do not see the wind, but we do see its effects on the leaves, on the physical world around it. We see something moving, something changing. In the same manner, the winnowing wind of the Holy Spirit, when it moves, we cannot see it, but we can see it removing the chaff. When the winnowing fan moves and that wheat is thrown up and the wind carries that chaff away and the pure wheat falls back down into that pile, we can see the effect of it. We can see it moving things out. We can see it cleansing. So we know the wind is there. We know the winnower is there. We see its effect on the wheat and we know that it is present. 
And in the same aspect, we cannot see the Holy Spirit, but we can see the effects of it on the person's life when he is cleansed by it. When the chaff and the trash and the pride and the arrogance and the selfishness and the sin and the traditions of men, error and deceit and deception is all being blown away, being cleansed from him. We can see it and we know that the winnower the Holy Spirit is present. We've seen the evidence of it. This is what makes that person a witness of the validity of the testimony of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is why the enemy in the end is overcome by it. The blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. And because they love not their own lives, even unto the death, they were willing to give it so that others could see the effect of the wind, how it changed them. Because you see, the chaff looks an awful lot like the wheat, but the chaff cannot bring forth life. It's not a seed, nor can it feed or edify others like the wheat can. It's only good for kindling in the fire in the end. So don't ever judge by appearance. Judge by what is being produced by it. And don't ever allow anyone to silence your testimony or your witness or you've become useless like the chaff. And I will warn you, my friend, that sometimes that winnowing wind of the Holy Spirit, it comes like a gentle breeze if that's all that it needs. It all depends on how tightly the wheat is holding on to that chaff because I've seen it come as a storm if need be. We all want to be willing to let go of the things that are keeping us from becoming edifying to the body, that are keeping us from becoming like Christ, that are keeping us from being used by the kingdom of God. We need to be willing to let them go easily because when we don't let them go easily, that gentle breeze can very quickly become a storm. And so many times I've seen the Lord so lovingly and gently warn somebody and say, look, son, daughter, that person is not meant to be in your life. You are not meant to be in relationship. You need to let that girl, that boy go, those friends go, whatever the situation. They are taking you off course and you are called to ministry and they're going to pull you away from me, from my plans for you. This is not what I have for you. And that person was not willing to let it go. So a storm came in and cleared the stage. And it was God's mercy that took it away because God had a plan for them. But they were holding on to that which was making them useless. So my friend, if this has happened or happening to you, I want to encourage you in this. That yes, the wind might be blowing. Yes, the rain might be falling. But if it's there to take the chaff out of the way and clear the stage, then praise him in the storm and wait. Because after the storm passes, it always brings new growth and new life. Thank him for the wind and the rain and just hold tight. Understand that this is reality that I am giving to you. We've got to grab hold of the truth, not what we want to hear, not the chaff, not the sugar, but the things that we need to help us to endure the storms, the trials, the tribulations, the wilderness, the Passover season, the cave, whatever the situation that we're in, we need to get through to the promise because it's right on the other end of the Jordan but that Jordan that's blocking us God's gonna part it but it's gonna take a leap of faith we got to get through the wilderness we've got to trust what he has to say we've got to let Egypt go we've got to be threshed in the process because he wants to make us more like him Daniel chapter 12 verse 10 about the return of the Lord speaking about his bride it says that many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I'm speaking wisdom to you today that will help you to endure through the hard seasons, through the trials and tribulations. That the word of God says that the bride will be purified and made white through trials. That we, the wheat, become the bread, the very body of Christ to be united with him. To be that pure and spotless bride comes through the furnace of affliction most times. And it's not his desire, but it's our pride. It's the things we don't want to let go of. It's the chaff. It's the trash. It's the things of this life. It's the flesh. It's the sin. It's our intellect. It's the things that we were raised in that we've not been willing to let go of. It's the things that we think we know, 
because we saw somebody else do it and we're trying to prove that it can work for us too but God never called us to it it's all of those things it's trusting in the arm of the flesh that he's got to get us away from so he can make us into pure bread he wants us to be like Christ that we might be broken for others and bring them into newness of life and so to that I bring you to the end of this process that once the winnowing has come the wheat has been purified to turn that wheat into bread we only have to do a few more things the first thing we've got to do is crush it and I advise you to go back to the podcast that we had about the anointing because the crushing is what brings the anointing and the anointing is what breaks the yoke of bondage off of others that's when God is able to use us in ministry when he can flow through us when he can trust us to rightly represent him then he's able to let the oil flow out in fact Jesus Christ himself when he prayed in the garden of Gethsemane Gethsemane literally means the olive press we all know that olive oil throughout scripture represented the anointing but the anointing only flows through that olive once it's been crushed once the flesh of it's been thoroughly broken And even Jesus himself endured this in that he, as he prayed to the point where his sweat fell as great drops of blood, he was being pressed in the garden of Gethsemane, which literally means the olive press. It was on the Mount of Olives. The anointing flowed that night that broke the yoke of bondage off of us. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to be crushed. Once that wheat is crushed, then has to be mixed with two things to make unleavened bread. Because we understand that there's a lot of different kinds of bread. There was the bread of Herod and the Pharisees. There was the leavened bread that was puffed up. There were all of these different breads that the scripture speaks unpleasantly of. But we understand that the unleavened bread, which represented the body of Christ, was very simple. It was made of that crushed grain, that flour. It was made of water. And it was made of oil. You have to add the water, which represents the word in scripture. We are washed by the water of the word. We are baptized in the word, in Jesus Christ himself, who is the word made flesh. We've got to get in the word of God. And it needed the oil, which is the Holy Spirit. And then you have to put it on the fire. It takes some heat. It takes the fire of God crushed wheat, us, broken before the Lord, his word, and his Holy Spirit. And then we can be the true body of Christ. So I know that there's a lot to take in. There's so many different layers to this. But in reality, every different layer comes back to the same thing. Humble before your king. Be willing to be broken for him. To pick up your cross daily. To follow his example, his leading. Understand that you need the word, the water, that you need the Holy Spirit, the fire, the oil, the crushing. That you need the correction, that you need the threshing, and that you need the refreshing of the winnowing wind. But above all things, let us remember that yes, he loves to give good gifts to his children, but we should never be like that multitude that came before him and said, do miracles so that we can get something from it, that we might consume it upon our own lust or teach us how to do it, that we might get vainglory or selfish gain from it. Be not like those men. Do not come to him with that kind of a heart. Come to him with humility and brokenness and say, Lord, let your Holy Spirit come and rest upon me and fill me up and if you desire to lead me into a wilderness then let it be so I am willing to be threshed until I let every bit of myself my flesh my pride and my arrogance go that I might be conformed to the image of Christ himself that I might rightly represent you that I might produce the peaceable fruits of righteousness which is your character Love, joy, peace, humility, kindness, gentleness, faith, self-control, 
that I might be a witness, a testimony to others that you are who you say you are and that your blood overcomes. Let my life be the proof of it. Purge me, Lord. Make me white. Make me that pure and spotless bride. I'm not running or denying the winnowing fan in your hand. I am standing boldly before it and saying, Lord, into your hand do I commit everything that I am. Thresh me where need be and refresh me where need be. I bend the knee to you, my king. Purge and purify me that I might become edifying to the greater body and glorifying to my risen Lord that I might be one with you, a true bride, one flesh, the body of Christ. Make me pure.